So we're joined again by Matt Delahunty from, uh, from the Atheist Experience. He's also the president of the Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, he's And he's also the host of the internet radio show, The Nonprofits. The Atheist Experience, as well as being a podcast, is also an Austin public access television cable show. Uh, it's also available on the internet. You can watch it live. If that's not enough, he's also the founder and contributor of of the Counter Apologetics Encyclopedia Iron Chariots and its subsidiary sites. Welcome back, Matt. You obviously said, you know, earlier in the show, you said that you were a Christian for 25 years. Um, did you have a deconversion process? You know, it, yes, I guess. Um, it was a really lengthy process for me. I, I was actually studying with the hopes of becoming a minister. I'd become kind of disillusioned with the tech industry and didn't want to get back into that. Had always felt that, uh, you know, God wanted me to be a preacher and there were people in my family who were convinced that I was running away from a calling to be a preacher. So I just kind of gave in and said, okay, God, you know, if you want me to be a preacher, you know, I'm, I'm over 30 now. Um, I got no other prospects. I'm, I'm ready to surrender. And at the time I had a roommate who was an atheist. And so we just never talked about religion. It was kind of an agreement We're we're the best of friends. We lived together for, I don't know, 12, 13 years or so, um, like brothers. And it was, you know, I believed he didn't. And the agreement was, it doesn't matter. So we're not going to talk about it. But when you, as somebody who's raised as a Southern Baptist, decide to really rededicate your life and seriously go after this uh, this mission to be a minister, one of the first things that you do is, I don't want my best friend to burn forever in hell, which means I needed to study specifically what, what I needed to say to save my best friend. And so even though he and I didn't have any discussions about this, I went out to look at atheist sites. What is it that, you know, atheists are saying? What, you know, I, I had no real experience with any of this. And it was a process. There wasn't a, a moment. Um, there were probably several moments, several kind of eye, eye-opening things, uh, especially when I'd, you know, I'd read the Bible multiple times throughout my life. And I'd come across an atheist saying, oh, the Bible says, you know, such and such, or commenting on uh, the Elijah story or whatever. And I'd say, oh, that's not in the Bible. And it was. And that's really eye-opening because we're taught, you know, or I was taught um, as a Christian that you're reading the Bible with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And now I've come to understand that with the guidance of the Holy Spirit is code for big old fucking blinders. (laughs) The obvious, you know, how many I I had a debate just a couple of weeks ago. Um, with Jay Lucas and it was supposed to be on does God exist and Jay presented exactly one argument or exactly three-fourths of an argument because he never really put it in entirely an argument form um, and it was the moral argument and it I, you know my rebuttal summer at the beginning of it this should be online pretty soon was just okay Jay's argument is God has to exist otherwise we don't live in the world that I want to live in and it, that really is his moral argument but I mean, when, when I'm looking at, at the at the moral argument and I, I challenge Jay on slavery because the Bible's crystal clear on slavery. And right, Jay comes right. back and says, no, the Bible doesn't advocate slavery. It regulates slavery. And I was like, well, oh. OK, I understand that it does that. But, you know, it does say that, you know, these who you can enslave, how much you can pay for them, the fact that you can beat them, that they become your property forever and that you can pass them on to your kids. And then Jay was like, no, 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 um, you have to let them go after seven years. And that's when I realized that this guy I'm debating who has a BS in Bible and I would say bachelor's in Bible, but BS in Bible <laughs> sounds so much better. Uh, didn't really know what he was talking about. And I almost felt bad for him. So that in the closing, I went up and said, you know, Jay's misrepresenting what's actually in the Bible. That passage about letting them go after six years or in their seventh year only applies if you're a Jew who has enslaved another Jew. Right. It doesn't count for, for, for neighboring tribes at all, yeah. right? That, that and and more than that is, uh, ironically, in the, in the next couple of verses after it says, hey, if you enslave another Jew, you got to let them go after six years. It then gives you this magical loophole so that you can make a Jew your slave forever. And that is you give them a wife 
And when their time to go, you know, comes up, they have to leave, but you get to keep their wife. And so they, if they come to you and say, you know, no, I love my wife. I don't want to leave. Well, then you take them before the elders. You drive a spike through their ear, pierce their, pierce their ear. And they become your slave forever. I mean, it's like, oh, you gotta, you, we don't want you enslaving the Jews, so you gotta let them go. But here's how you can get around it. <laughs> well, plus the idea that, that you you could allow for conditional or short term slavery. How is that less evil? I mean, it's just it's evil, but just for a shorter period of time. It's not not evil, and it's not not it, it's not moral. It wouldn't be moral. We wouldn't pass a, a law that said, you know, now oh, you can have slaves again, but you can only have them for six years. You know, that doesn't mitigate the damage in any way. It, it's, it's an absurdity. The standard apologetic is that this is something about indentured servitude. The, the problem is, is that uh, the Bible specifically talks about indentured servitude in other places um, and in other ways. And you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I don't care. People, you know, and the, the other objection which Jay came up with as well was, well, your your perception of slavery is colored by you know slavery in in the U.S. as if you know we all saw roots and that's all we know about slavery. And if the Bible specifically says that they're my property forever and that I can beat them as long as they don't die within a couple of days, I don't think I my perception's that colored. And moreover, I don't care. I don't care if you love your slaves and take them out to parties and buy them frilly things and, you know, you're just the nicest, coolest <laughs> massa ever. If you own another right. human being as property, limiting their freedom, that's fucking wrong. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's almost like you're more moral than the religious. How does that know. work? I, I, I think it's got something to do with reason and evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that I'm no longer willing to sacrifice my humanity. But it, the question that you had originally asked was about my uh, my fall, my falling away period or my epiphany to no longer be religious. Uh, and it was a lot of stuff like that over the course of just less than two years before I, I couldn't uh, call myself a Christian anymore and rapidly descended into, or I'll say ascended, uh, identifying as an atheist. <laughs> So when did you uh, – so you do this TV show, The Atheist Experience, very uh, popular show among the atheist crowd. Uh, when did you start doing that show? The show has been on for 14 or 15 years. I've been on it for the last six or close to maybe seven now. I can't I, – I lose track. Uh, I called into a show. Basically, somebody at work knew that I was writing about atheism and that I'd been an atheist for a couple of years. And they said, hey, have you seen this TV show on public access? And I was like, no, you know, I don't have any interest in just listening to atheists. Why would I listen to people who are going to tell me stuff I already agree with? It just kind of seemed like a waste of time. And uh, it, it happened to be the case that Jeff D. Uh, lived in the same apartment complex that I did, and he had put a flyer up on the mailbox. So I went out to get the mail one Sunday because um, I was too lazy to get it Saturday. <laughs> And probably for the week before. <laughs> and I saw this flyer and I was like, oh, you know, I didn't got anything better to do. So I watched the show and it was really kind of intriguing because it's not just atheists sitting around, you know, preaching atheist ideas, whatever the hell that is to people. It, it's conversation. It's, it's a call, live call in show. And I loved it. I ended up calling in either probably, I think three weeks later, I called in to ask a question. Um, and then ended up at dinner after the show and then was in the studio the next week, you know, screening calls and then worked behind the scenes for a little while. Uh, and then within a couple months, I guessed I did a guest spot on the show when uh, a week when Jeff did, couldn't make it. And it was like a couple months later, I'm the president of the organization. A couple months after that, I'm, you know, taking over the show and uh, the rest is history. I, I have to ask you. Uh, you get some some real bizarre folks that call into that show. I mean, some real fucking weird dudes. I was listening to a show the other day where a guy called up and and I think you guys called him out, but he you know he tried to pretend that he believed in a sun god. I, I don't know if you happen to recall the the, the Yahoo that uh, I, I wasn't on that show. No, I've but heard. I I assume that you you listened to the, these callers are just they're just goofballs. 
a lot of these callers that call it, not all of them, but a lot of the callers that call up are just fucking goofballs. And it seems to me like they, they, they're calling up and they're trying to uh, convert you. They're trying to, to, to teach you something. You know, they have this idea that if only they can get it through to your head, that, that you're sitting there on the other end of the phone just waiting for somebody to come up with the, the magic answer. And here I am, the caller, and I've got the magic bullet for, for, for your atheism, and I'm going to convert this guy right over the show. And uh, I, I guess what, what occurs to me listening to it is how do you restrain yourself from jumping through the goddamn camera and strangling some of these dimwits? Well, I think the first thing is the the laws of physics prevent me from doing that. That does make it tougher. Um, also, I don't think that they're entirely wrong because um, I'm, I'm only interested in truth. And so if somebody actually had, you know, the argument and evidence that would convince me, then, you know, great, call in. I, I want to know, you know. But a lot of, we've, we've dealt with a lot of callers lately who are clearly uh, prank callers or pose. I think the sun god guy was like straight up quoting from carlin and somebody else and so you know the, he wasn't for real um there were people in the past uh that we had to actually ban from the show one guy was trying to tell me how to contact the spirit world by constructing a mirror um you know right down to the type of wood and screws and the fact that i needed to tie a rope around my waist and bring a friend with me so that i could hold the mirror under running water at a creek but that this would open up the spirit world and the rope was to have my friend you know, hold on tight so I didn't get sucked in through the mirror. And I'm just thinking, you know, I should just build the mirror small enough so that my girth can't quite fit through it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized that if we're talking about magic portals to another world, yeah, it might not make any difference. But yeah, there's been all kinds of, there, there, there's some sincere people who really, they're, they're not just undereducated, they've been miseducated. Um, I had somebody email me today. There's a guy uh, who had called in, I think, from Australia, and his uh, his name may have been Dave, uh, who was just like over the top crazy. And we didn't talk. I haven't talked to him since that I'm aware of. But this guy continued having a conversation with him, and I think he ended it today because Dave, who is a a theist opposed to evolution and just doesn't understand it no matter how many times you explained it what he said to close the argument and i have it up in front of me now because my only response was wow was um people have been wearing clothes for thousands of years why haven't our bodies evolved natural clothes that come out of our skin <laughs> He did not say that. He did. You had no response to that. There was, there's a. Oh, I have a response. It's laughing. You see, there's a clip of the show on YouTube um, that's like got hundreds of thousands of views. Where this guy calls up and he's like, you know, uh, what wakes you up in the morning? And then, oh well, you know, like we've got a god alarm clock or something, and all this, and we're going through and we're explaining very, very simple concepts, and we're trying to be a, a, as simple as we can. And he's like, you know, where do you get your energy from, the energy that makes you move? And, you know, I pointed out, I think, or maybe Russell, we were both on the show, that ultimately that it comes from the sun. The sun provides energy to the planet, which, <laughs> you know, it causes the plants to grow and we eat the plants. Well, first of all, I didn't get that far. As soon as I said ultimately it comes from the sun, he's like, well, then why don't we die when the sun goes down? And so I think Russell explained the <laughs> the, the process by which oh my the gosh. sun nourishes his plants and then we eat the plants and animals and we store this energy. And Russell made the mistake, although I don't think it should be considered a mistake on his part, of saying we store this energy like a battery. That was how he was going to explain why we don't die when the sun goes down. And this guy said, well, well if that's the case, then why don't I get electrocuted in the shower? The, what? Did, he think, did this guy not understand that the sun doesn't go away when it goes down? <laughs> the sun does, does it just voip out of existence for eight or nine hours while you're sleeping every night? That it that's not those wow. aren't my favorite calls though. I mean, I'm kind of a masochist. I when when Matt Slick called in and we had a 45 minute debate on the transcendental argument for the existence of God, um, I liked that because. I, I like the the deeper philosophical discussions. I like the sincere discussions that we've had with theists and Christians in particular 
who will call in and actually have an honest discussion where they ask questions and we ask questions and they try to provide answers. Um, I don't like being the asshole who hangs up on people for arguing dishonestly, but I'll do it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, and, and this actually, I think one of the things that people get down on a lot of atheists about, I know that we catch a lot of flack for this is that people will say like you've got if you have uh, an attitude, some sort of attitude like uh, a confrontational attitude or an irreverent attitude that it's not helping. You're not helping spread the cause of atheism. But I see that you don't take any bullshit on your show. If somebody's not going to answer the question, you're just as quick to knock them right off the air. Um, you know, you don't take a confrontational attitude, so to speak, but you certainly don't take any bullshit. And I and I I just feel like I feel like. You you certainly have a reach, and you can reach people. And I've heard people call your show that are not playing the Poe, and actually do have a moment where they're like, "Holy shit, what have I been thinking all these years?" So I think you're reaching people. I don't think that that argument really holds any water. Yeah, it's it's strange. I've you know I've been doing this for a long time, and I constantly, you know, my inbox is always full. I'm. You know, even after archiving thousands of emails, I'm 315 behind again. I'm going to stay behind forever. I, I've given up on that. But we get, you know, I've had feedback from people. Pick a show and a particular call. And if it was anything that was not just dead ass boring, and if there was any kind of back and forth, I will get email from people saying that that was the best call ever and the best job I've ever done. And oh my God, you were so patient. I don't know how you could be that patient. And I will also get email from people saying that that was the worst call ever and I was a complete asshole. Now, I gave up a long time ago in any hope of trying to please everybody and I'm my own worst critic. After the show's over, I leave and on the drive to dinner, I'm replaying every call in my head saying, oh, you should have said this. Oh, why didn't you say that? Or, yeah, oh, you need to remember that because the way you said that might actually be good. You know, that happens a little less often than the than the criticism. But when when I'm on the show and taking calls, I try to be fair. I try to make sure that people are getting about as good as they're giving. If they're willing to have an honest discussion, I kept people on for 40 minutes. You know, back when we were doing a 90-minute show, there's several 40-minute calls where I left let them go because I thought the conversation, conversation was productive. I didn't think I was going to change their mind or they were going to change mine, but we were making points that might benefit somebody else. And that's who I'm doing the show for is somebody else. I'm not, not the person that I'm talking to. I mean, we had Ray Comfort on. I don't think for a minute I'm going to change his mind, although I did get him to admit that he doesn't agree with everything in the Bible, which I thought, and that Russell and I are delusional or, or stupid, uh, which I thought was a win for both. <laughs> That guy, I, that guy's a great rhetorician, though. I mean, really, he he just he has his stuff together, and he's a, he's a hard guy to debate. So I, I'm happy that you did well against him. Yeah, you know, I, for a while I wanted to actually, you know, have a formal public debate with him, but now that I've been doing more formal public debates, uh, race uh, who race beneath me. It's I, you know, I, I hate saying that, but the fact of the matter is I've had enough discussions with him um, and everybody knows that, you know, he's just he it's not I say he's incapable of being honest and honestly addressing the issues. Um, and that's not true in every case. And I don't think that he's lying. I think that his religious presuppositions keep him from addressing certain things. But on the subject of, of calls, I, I got a suggestion email just the other day that said, um, uh, I think your attitude towards, attitude towards callers could be refined a bit further. You never insult Christianity or show anger or, ha- anger or hatred directly, which isn't true. Uh, so they clearly haven't watched enough shows. What, what gets me sometimes is the smirks and laughter while the caller is talking. I know some of their arguments are simply too ridiculous to keep a straight face, but such expressions degrade your image as a good show host and might make you come off as arrogant. And I thank them for the feedback. Um, I didn't point out that I don't mind being considered arrogant on occasion because I think I am arrogant on occasion and condescending. And it's not something that, you know, I'm particularly proud of. But ridiculous ideas are, by definition, deserving of ridicule. That's why we gave it that label. And if I sit there stone-faced and try to seriously address a claim that shouldn't be taken seriously... 
I lose credibility. There's, you know, the example that I've used before is that some kids stop believing in Santa because they go out and investigate and discover the truth, and others stop believing because older kids on the bus made fun of them for believing. And I opt for a little bit of both. <laughs> educate, educate and treat people well, but ridicule the ideas. It's not the the person that I'm smirking or face palming over. It's what they're saying. Now, sometimes I'll be in a, a you know I don't I don't find myself in a lot of these debates. I normally don't uh, don't talk to people uh, about their religion. It just never comes up for me. You know, I know that you put yourself in that situation a lot. So you get you get into these conversations all the time. So a lot of people look to you for. Uh, uh, I'll see I'll see a lot of callers will call you and they'll say. I've recently ran into this argument. Can you help me out with it? And I think that that's a great resource to sort of be able to turn to someone else who has uh, obviously has uh, a really great grasp on logic to help them uh, work through an argument. But one argument that always kind of stumps me, and, and maybe you can do a little coaching here. You can help me out with an argument. Uh, there's always the, right. the, the concept of uh, when people say, well, you know, you don't believe in – you want evidence for God. Uh, without evidence for God, you're not going to believe. But what about love? Love is an intangible thing that we all seem to believe in. What, what about that? What about that? The love thing, uh, it, it's usually phrased a little different than, than I think you did, which was that you can't prove love, which actually, actually right. you can. Because um, love is a label that we put on a, a wide variety of human actions, the it, it's not something that exists. Love is a like every other emotion, like you know every other thought. It's just a brain state. It is a chemical brain state, and within you know an EEG, you can actually go in and find out a little bit about what are people experiencing with love. It seems people are like oh this this diminishes it. You're turning everything into you know uh, chemicals and electrical interaction in the brain. But love is so much more than that. No, it's fucking not. <laughs> it's not. And, and, and I can, you know, how do you know that your wife loves you? Well, I don't know. Maybe she's a psychopath who's really, really good at acting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know in the for sure sense that, that these people want. But I know in any reasonable sense, and by the way, when, you know, we're kind of getting into the territory of what qualifies as, a, as knowledge. Um, and I don't, I think absolute certainty is a red herring outside of just a couple of things that I won't bore everybody by going into. And so all the things that I talk about that I know, you know, I know this, I know that. I know to a reasonable degree of certainty uh, that my wife loves me. I know that I love her. I don't know how much. I don't even know how to necessarily quantify it. But when I see a mother, you, we're so good at it that when we see a mother with a new baby, it's obvious. We are, we are watching an expression of love. It's detectable. It may even be, you know, I, mean, I would imagine that it's detectable by EEG, but we're putting a label on that. And it's, it's one category of love, romantic love, love a parent has for their kid, the love that siblings have, the love you have for a friend. These things exist as brain states, but we put the labels on the actions and the activities. And it's the reason that we can look at some parent who's suffering from some mental disorder who doesn't connect to their kid. So when, when their kid goes missing and they're on the news, there are people who can spot right away this person's deranged. They're not acting the way somebody would act if their kid was actually missing, and they're probably responsible for it. The fact that we can't quantify it, and we may be able to at some point, it doesn't matter. No, at a minimum, if you're saying, um, well, God is roughly the equivalent in in the you know the the space of epistemology to love, I got to call bullshit because I can point to love all over there, and I can experience love, and it's ubiquitous and everything else. This God thing that people claim is ubiquitous and experiential. I've followed the instructions that people have offered guarantee that I would experience God and did not. So clearly there's a flaw in their methodology. One of those two things is somewhat demonstrable and the other one is not at all. Yeah, but Matt, I mean, you didn't open your heart. You know, I mean, you got to open your heart to, to, to Jesus and all that nonsense and then you'll experience <laughs> it and then you know, and then you'll experience that uh, that grand, that, that, you know, that, that hole in your in yourself that we were talking about earlier that all atheists must by definition according to the nuts experience, you know, then that would be filled and you would be complete. I mean, and certainly you can, you can understand that. They, you know, I, I want to 
I, I say that it's a good thing that um, you guys are on my side and being funny. There are few things that theists can say. I mean, I don't know if you've you've seen Jeff D when somebody talks about the threat of hell and how he uh, loses his shit. But there are a few things that can piss me off faster. There's a handful of things. One, treat me like an idiot, and and you will suffer. Right. Um. The second one is to be so deluded. There's nothing more arrogant and condescending than somebody saying to me without knowing anything about me or who I was or what I actually went through that I didn't try hard enough. I don't know how hard other people tried. I don't know how much time they spent on their knees in prayer. I don't know how much time they spent pleading for some sort of information from God. But anybody who spent more time and did more than me, good for them. But when there's a fucking million pointless, stupid people who are running around claiming that they have had this experience and if only I'd open my heart after the shit that oh, I actually yeah. went through fuck you, any god who wants me to do more is not <laughs> worth even finding Right? no kidding man um, I, I was going to go back to, to something that you said about uh, you know how there are, there are certain theists who will make the argument that well, you know, atheism and, and the explanations, as soon as you start to give an explanation, you know, well, what about this? Well, you know, you can actually, you know, look at the, the chemical patterns in the brain and you can see how love works and you can see that stuff on an EEG and you can image that in a functional MRI scanner. And, you know, you start to come up with answers for these things. And it's like, well, then then you come up to the, the argument. And I've heard it and I'm sure you've heard it many more times that, you know, that's reductionist, that you're that you're diminishing. And you, you touched on this briefly, that you're diminishing through reductionism. And uh, the, the first thing that occurs to me is like, well, it, it, you say diminishing, I'm saying explaining. Yeah, it, it, we're, we're not reducing something's importance in our life by explaining how that thing works. My car is not less important to my daily activities because I understand that it uses an con internal combustion engine to get me from point A to point B rather than, you know, pixie dust and hope. So th that argument, just it it's just a wish fulfillment, right? Well, it, the claim that someone is just being reduction reductionist in their explanation, um, that that is actually much worse than anything that any of us who have in, you know engaged in some reductionism have done because like you pointed out um knowing what's going on in my brain even if i knew and understood it completely doesn't diminish in any way what i experience knowing that a flower is ultimately made up of specific you know chemicals and 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 atoms doesn't diminish how pretty it is or in my case how wilted and dying it is you know, if if that's what's happening, it, it, it's this is about they're trying to add something to the truth. And we're saying the truth alone is enough. It doesn't change. The garden doesn't become prettier because there's magical pixies that are that are, you know, going in and fertilizing it every night with their shit. <laughs> All right, so so Matt, it was wonderful having you on. Matt, you uh, you obviously have your uh, your hand in a few podcasts as well as uh, you know some people who have some podcasts. So could you tell our listeners where to find your show, The Atheist Experience, as well as the other podcasts? Absolutely, um, you can watch The Atheist Experience live as it streams every Sunday from four thirty to five thirty. You can go to atheist-experience dot com for more information about that show. Uh, nonprofits is nonprofitsradio dot com. That's P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, uh, because we're punny guys. <laughs> and we should be back live with the new nonprofits this coming Saturday, The whatever the hell date it is. But more importantly, because my wife is just generally awesome, there's the Godless Bitches podcast, which is also available. You can find all of this starting with the Atheist Community of Austin, which is atheist-community.org. Thanks so much for coming on, Matt. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.